Good morning. It's a little earlier, but here we are. Okay, uh, announcements. The Deacons Ladies Lunch Gathering will meet this Wednesday at Anna Mays at 1130. Uh, there's more information in the bulletin. Uh, uh, call ahead and order your meal and give them your credit card number and they'll have it ready for you when you get there. PFC committees will meet Wednesday, this Wednesday at 515 in Gaiman Hall. Other meetings for June are listed in the bulletin. Deacons are not meeting till the 20th or 21st, that third week. The office will begin summer hours on Friday, June 9th. Uh, the office will be closed on Fridays through September 1st with normal working hours on Monday through Thursday, 8.30 to 12.30. This is the first Sunday of the month, so we'd like to remind everyone that deacons appreciate any offerings you might give them. Please use the green envelopes or write deacon on the note portion of your check if you wish to help them with their local missions and projects financially. In the past uh, three months, we have given money to Eisenhower School for kids that needed um, clothing articles. Uh, we've given money to uh, the uh, mission uh, house that, that's at Poplar and 12th Street, and you may have read about that in the paper uh, this week. They had a, a shout out or a portion of the First Friday program. We've given money to uh, the Tornado Relief Fund for those that were affected by the severe tornado outbreak in Mississippi, and we've given money to the Ukraine Relief Fund as well. So we're, this is the mission and the Deacons Committee. So money is being spent in good areas to help lots of people, and we also, of course, gave to the Access Center for the Food Bank. So there's, your, your money is being well spent in lots of good needs. Uh, other announcements? Does anyone have any other announcements they would like to share today? Yeah. Yep. Okay, so worship committee will not be meeting this Wednesday, but all the other committees will be. Uh, I want to let you know about the cards in the back since I'm here and I've got it. Um, we have wellness wishes to Jay, Jay Ayers who's been diagnosed with cancer. And Lisa, what kind of cancer is it? I can't remember. Well, I couldn't. I, anyway, in any case, colon cancer. Okay. And then a wellness wish, wellness wishes to Karen Welch, who had knee surgery this last week. And then a sympathy card to Jonna and Jeff Weiner on the passing of his mother. So please sign those cards so they can get out in a timely manner. Are there any other announcements? If not, let's stand and pass the piece of price. Please join me in our call to worship. It is a responsive reading found in your bulletin. Give thanks to the Lord, for God is good. God's last love endures forever. Jesus calls us to go and make disciples. 
baptizing them in the name of God. Join me in our opening prayer. God whose fingers, oh, oh I guess, am I doing this alone? I guess so. Uh, God whose fingers sculpt sun and moon and curl the baby's ear, spirit brooding over chaos before the naming of day, Savior sending us to earth's ends with words and water, startle us with the grace, love, and communion of your unity and diversity so that we may live in praise with your majesty, your majestic name. Amen. Please join me in singing our opening hymn, number two, Come Thou Almighty God. God knows our hearts and knows the things that keep us from being in true relation with the triune God. We are promised that if we acknowledge these things, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Therefore, let us, before God and in the presence of one another, confess our sins before the Lord, using the prayer of confession that is found in your order of service. God, who is three in one, one in three, we confess that we have turned away from you. We gaze upon ourselves as if we are worthy of worship. We take your creation into our hands, not to love, but to use and then to discard. We go to the people of the land, not to serve, but to press them into service. We claim to have solved you, even though your very nature is mystery. We do not deserve that you would even notice us, but we pray for mercy because you are merciful. Flame of love, purify us from sin. Eternal one, lead us to your truth. Risen Savior, baptize us into union with you. Transform us into disciples who worship you alone, God who is Trinity. Hear this assurance of pardon. God knows who we were made to be and has been waiting to help restore us to ourselves. 
to each other, to community. Thanks be to God, we are forgiven. Let us pray. Spirit of wisdom and truth, pour out your grace upon us as we listen for the living word and the words of scripture, so that our hearts may be set on fire and our lives proclaim your deeds of power. Amen. Our first scripture lesson is from Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 through 3, and verses 26 through 31. Hear these words. The beginning. In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. Then God said, Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky over the livestock and over all the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over, and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Then God said, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seeds in it. They will be yours for food. And to all the beasts of the earth and all the birds of the sky and all the creatures that move along the ground, everything that has the breath of life in it, I give every green plant for food. And so it was. God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. And that was evening, and there was morning the sixth day.
Amen. Our second scripture reading this morning comes from the epistle known as 2 Corinthians. We'll be reading from chapter 13, verses 11 through 13, the very end of that letter from Paul to the church at Corinth. Finally, brothers and sisters, rejoice, strive for full restoration, encourage one another, be of one mind, live in peace, and the God of love and peace will be with you. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All God's people here send their greetings. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And a gospel reading this morning from the gospel according to Matthew chapter 28 verses 16 through 20, a very familiar passage for many people. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always, to the very end of the age. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, among other things, if you've ever been wondering where that blessing that I tend to use at the end of the service as we're dismissing comes from, you just heard it, right there at the end of 2 Corinthians, that very last passage that Paul writes to them in blessing. Now, so now you know. Now, there's an obvious reason it shows up in the lectionary scriptures for today, duh, but that simple and straightforward passage does not change the fact that for preachers, Trinity Sunday is a field of landmines. As one of the few special Sundays on the lectionary calendar that takes as its subject a doctrine of the church rather than a particular event in the church's life or tradition, it can easily seduce a preacher into a futile attempt into explaining such a doctrine. Not only is such a sermon likely to be very unsuccessful at keeping anybody's attention, it is also one that puts the preacher at risk for any of a multitude of errors that have, at some point or another in the church's history, been denounced as heresies. Not kidding. If you saw my Facebook page this, earlier this week, you might have noticed an odd little animated example of these pitfalls attached to the Trinity and trying to explain it. It's a cartoon in which St. Patrick, that guy way back in Ireland, attempts to explain the Trinity to a pair of supposedly simple Irish cousins at their request using a series of metaphors. So what's it like, Patrick? Now, trouble is, every time St. Patrick pulls out a metaphor, these simple Irish country folk shoot Patrick down with the name of the heresy that is expressed in that metaphor. Water appearing in three different forms, liquid, but ice, but also vapor. That's modalism, Patrick, which is to say that it's a heresy that was denounced way back at the Council of Constantinople, back when years only had three digits in their numbers. The three-leaf clover, the one that Patrick is so famous for, that's partialism, Patrick, a violation of the teaching that the three persons of the Trinity are one substance and are not distinct parts of God. The same thing goes on in the cartoon until Patrick finally rants, all right, fine, 
The Trinity is a mystery that cannot be comprehended by human reason, but is understood only through faith, and is best confessed in the words of that Athanasian Creed, which states that we worship one God in Trinity, and Trinity in unity, neither confusing the persons nor dividing the substance, that we are compelled by the Christian truth to confess that each distinct person is God and Lord, and that the deity of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit is one, equal in glory, co-equal in majesty. To which the simple cousins respond more or less, well, why didn't you say so, Patrick? Easy, right? So, no metaphors from me today. Accidental or not, I do not need any heresies to deal with right now. Preaching is hard enough as it is. So, what's the point? If it's that difficult to try to talk about, what is the possible benefit of having a whole Sunday of the church's calendar devoted to this very mysterious and seemingly inexplicable concept? Why have a Trinity at Sunday at all if all it does is get preachers in trouble? I realize that for some people that's a perfectly good answer as to why I have Trinity Sunday, but leaving that aside, I think there are a few reasons. Now, I don't think this is a primary reason, but it's, I think it's kind of an important one. One of the great benefits of having a doctrine like the Trinity, and believe me, this is not the only doctrine of the church that falls into this category, but having a doctrine like this particularly for the development of a real and humble and mindful spirituality in us Christians is precisely the fact that it is so terribly difficult, if not impossible, to explain or to comprehend. What we deal with, what we live in, in the Christian faith, there's a lot of mystery to it. And the quicker we learn to accept that, the better off we are. Today's reading, unfortunately, helps demonstrate how scriptures, any scripture, and there are a few that seem to reference or gesture towards God as Trinity, tends to do so almost in passing. Not at all trying to explain what they're saying, they're just kind of taking it as a given. You know, when, when Paul writes to them, you know, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit, that's just what he knows and what he assumes they know as well. Even the reading from Genesis seems to have just a little tiny bit of a hint of a suggestion of such a thing. You know, that wind from God that was spoken of in verse 3, you know, it's not doesn't feel like that big a leap to have that being the Holy Spirit. And then now in verse 26, when God says, let us make humankind in our own image. Mm -hmm. Now you pretty clearly could just as easily be a divine version of the royal we that grammarians like to talk about. Well, it's at least a kind of a suggestive choice of pronoun. Trouble is, many have taken that suggestion and run with it, and generally run with it much farther than they should have, and ended up in modalism or partialism or who knows what heresy. See, that's the trouble. Humanity has this terrible destructive habit of taking very scant scriptural evidence and turning it, or trying to turn it, into hardened dogma to be used for judgment rather than instruction for the purpose of edifying the body of Christ. And this is hardly the only thing where that's true. Just a few years ago, I was supposed to be on vacation, somehow ended up in a conversation with someone else that led to this question being asked by that other person, so who am I supposed to say wrote it? it being one of the New Testament epistles where the authorship isn't terribly well known. To which my only response was, you're supposed to say that you don't know. And that's the thing. We Christians really are supposed to say a lot more often than we do, I don't know. I don't know how God did that, but God did it. Anyway, today's scripture readings fit into that category pretty well. Much ink has been spilled using these readings to prove some arcane point about the doctrine of the Trinity that simply cannot be sustained by Jesus' final blessing on his disciples or Paul's benediction to the Corinthians. The point is, these scriptures don't prove God as Trinity at all. They take it as a given. It's simply a statement that it is. Now, all of this kind of thing does lead us to wonder sometimes why we think we will win the world to discipleship by logic and factual argument, or by having an airtight system in which no one can poke holes. I mean, really, 
That's not how faith works. I mean, the sooner that the sooner that we give up the idea that we have God pegged, we've got everything figured out and locked down and known perfectly, better off we are as a church. And I mean the whole church. Really. What would be the point of an easily explainable God? What good is a God that can fit into our shirt pocket? What kind of God is that? I mean, we are called to live with mystery. And the Trinity is one small but important corner of that mystery. The very nature of God is not something we're going to solve in an equation or anything like that. Now, following on this, another possible value of con contemplating the Trinity as a subject is to consider perhaps its suggestion of community and togetherness in the very nature of God, God's self. God is one, even as God is three. God is inherently in relationship, which is also kind of how Christianity is supposed to work. We are together in this thing. You know, Christianity isn't this individual struggle that we bear heroically all by ourselves. We do this together as the body of Christ. And maybe remembering the three in one and one in three God might help us remember that fact. So God is one, even as God is three, Father, Son, and Spirit, in a relational sense and in the formula we frequently speak in most churches. But, for example, we could also speak of the Trinity as creator, redeemer, sustainer, which would be emphasizing the ways that humanity has experienced God working in God's world, from creation to the redeeming act of the cross to the ongoing sustaining presence recognized in the form of mighty wind and tongues like fire from last week's Pentecost story. Maybe we'd be better off widening our vocabulary for speaking of the persons of the Trinity rather than being tied down again to a single exclusive formula that doesn't teach us, doesn't help us draw real deep in any sort of deeper experience of God as one and God as three. An experience that might, again, draw us to consider our own experience as community as the body of Christ, as the recipients of the fruits of the Spirit, so that we understand ourselves much more as we, and don't get so hung up on me. And again, these passages, it's worth pointing out and elaborating a little bit, just kind of take it as a given. This is what God is. Both of these passages seem more or less to assume a three-in-one God, even as they put forth God as one. Matthew's record of Jesus' parting words to his disciples include a formula that has become incredibly familiar in the life of the church, so much so that we almost don't listen to it anymore. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. We hear it very regularly in baptism and in a whole lot of other parts of the church as well. There is, if we listen, there is a certain moment of pause when we, who recognize Jesus as Son of God, notice that in that blessing to his disciples, he is invoking himself 